Everybody else stand with me as we go to read God's word this morning. Hebrews 11, verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because everyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You may be seated. Thank you. I'll say it again. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's what the word says. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Today, what we're about to do is we're going to finish, well, we're going to continue what Pastor Greg started last week. This is part two of the road to recovery. And yes, and last week he did the R, which is realize I'm not God. I admit I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing, and my life is unmanageable. My life has become unmanageable. And unmanageable to you might be totally different than unmanageable to me. So whatever that means to you. Today, I'm going to talk about step two. Earnestly believe that God exists. We have to earnestly believe that God exists. And that I, you, we matter to him. And that he has the power to help us recover from whatever it is that we have going on in our lives. He has the power. And I think a lot of the times, we'll get into that, is we try to take on his power. His glory. We put ourselves in God's position. And we'll talk about that, a little bit of that today also. Anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That means that if I go out there really looking for God, he's going to say, what do you need, my son? What do you need, my son? I'm earnestly seeking him. I'm on my knees praying. I'm, I'm asking for forgiveness. I'm doing righteous things. I'm doing exactly what he asked me to do. And he says, I'm going to reward you. If that's not awesome, you can't say amen to that. I don't know what's going on because I'm thankful. Thank you, God. I've been rewarded. I've been redeemed. Have mercy. I don't know. Earnestly. And what matters to you? We read Hebrews 11 and 6. We have to acknowledge, first and foremost, that God does exist, that he does exist. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen. I'm telling you, I can't make trees grow. I can't speak into existence the earth, the stars. I don't know if you guys have been out on a pretty starry night, but I don't have that much power. It would be, I, I'd be scared to have it. I would do bad things with it, probably. But it says, the fool says there is no God in Psalms 14 and 1. The fool says there is no God. I don't ever want to be a fool. <laughs> I've been that before. I don't want to go back to that again. Number two, we need to understand God's character. And the only way to really understand God's character is to study his word. Seek him earnestly so that he can show you what his character is. We tend to believe we know automatically because I've read a couple of, I've read a couple of Psalms. I've read a couple of Proverbs. I've, I've studied, been to a Bible study quote, unquote, I know what God wants from me. But it's more than that. It's an honest relationship with the Lord. An honest relationship with him. And here's what I love so much. God knows all about my situation. He knows all about your situation. All he asks you to do is Talk to him about it. He knows already. I don't know. That makes me want to cry that I, he knows. I don't have to hide anything anymore. He knows. 
You have seen the crisis in my soul, Psalms 31 and 7 says. You know how foolish I've been, Psalm 69 and 5 says. You know how foolish I've been? How awesome is that? Now I don't even have to go around lying. Because he knows. That's what's, that's what's so awesome, is I don't even have to lie anymore. I don't have to try to hide anything anymore. Because he knows. He knows. And the most awesome thing, and we sung about this this morning, is God cares about your situation. He cares about you. I'm glad he cares about me. Hey, thank you, God. But he cares about you just as much as he cares about me, and that's what's so awesome. He has enough love to go around. He is like a father to us, tender and symbolic. And he knows what we are made, what we're made of. We're made of dust. And in Psalms 103.13, he tells us that's what we're made of. We're made of dust. But he loves us anyway. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love in Jeremiah 31 and 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. That means like, all right, well, I mess up today. He quits loving me like humans do. We do. That's what we do. Um, You've messed up today, so mm -mm, no hugs for you today. God doesn't do that. God says, you messed up. Okay, come to me, repent, and I still love you. And you get a good hug. Oh, my gosh. How awesome is that to feel that warmth of the Holy Spirit? God shows his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. And he tells us that in Romans 5 and 8. He sent his son. And I don't know. I don't have that. That would be so hard for me to send any of my kids to die for you guys. And I love all of you. But my father in heaven sent his only son to die for us so that we don't even have to deal with that anymore. How awesome. Because he loves us enough. He loves us more than we could even love ourselves. And this is, this is, this one statement, it saved my life. God can change me and my situation. When I earnestly believe that God could change me in my situation, oh, how the mercies of God, I don't even begin to understand, and I don't even try to understand, but I know that my Father in heaven can change me in any situation. Think about that. Any situation. Because we believe some things are hopeless. It can never be fixed. I can never get my wife back. I can never have a relationship with my kids. I can never pay all my bills. I can never be loved again. But God says, I'll give you all that and more. And more. Not just what you've lost, but I'm going to give you that and a little bit more. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome, I think. So I pray you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is. And we don't put his power in a little box. Which is what we do with humans. We, you know, we, we, well, he can't do that. Well, my father can do all things. He breathed. He spoke all this into existence. He knew that we, we, we would be sitting here today way before I was even created. So my God, this power is not in a box. It doesn't come from a generator. The same power that raised Christ from the dead. It says in Ephesians 1 and 20, I pray you begin to understand how, incredible, how incredibly great the power of his, his power is to help those who believe in him. The same power that raised Christ from the dead. So he has that same power that he used to raise Christ from the dead, he's willing to use to help you. That exact same power. The love that was used to save our life, he's willing to help rebuild, restore, and make new. Make new. That's what's awesome. He gets to make, we, we are made anew. 
It's not like uh, it's not like an old car that we go get a get a tire on. It's that's not a, that didn't come with the original. We're new. We're ah. Oh. It's awesome just to know that when you wake up one morning, nothing, I can't wait till the time when I go to heaven and nothing aches anymore. I don't know about you guys. I'm, I'm waiting for that day. Thank you, God. Come soon. No. All right. So, and then we have to remember God, accept God's offer to help me. We have to remember that. We have to accept God's offer to help us. Here's, 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 here's the crazy part that I've noticed so much about people. And you know, you guys know I work in recovery. And I see people coming all the time and they say, God, help me. Now let me do it for you. God, help me, but I'm going to do the work. How do you ask somebody to help you and then you push them out of the way? And that's what we do with God sometimes. We ask for his help. We ask for his blessings. We ask for him to come down and show us what to do. And then we say, well, I've got it. I appreciate it. Thank you, but I'm going to do this myself. I have the answers. But if we had the answers, we wouldn't be praying, would we? If we had the answers, we wouldn't be down on our knees. If we had the answers, we wouldn't be looking up. If we had the answers, we wouldn't be in so much pain. So we don't have the answers. God does. And all we have to do is allow him, allow him to help us. For God is a work within you and me, giving you the will and the power to achieve his purpose. In Philippians it says that. For God is a work within you, giving you the will and the power to achieve his purpose. He's got a purpose for your life. The problem is sometimes we, we step in and say, I want to do what I want to do. And God says, okay, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. See how well it works for you. And then once you hit wherever you hit, wherever you land, where you land, he says, now I'm willing to give you another shot. Are you, are you willing to try? And we go, yes, I'm willing to try, God. But you take a, you, you get on the back burner. I'm going to drive this car again. And... He allows it again to happen for us. It's not that he doesn't love you. The Spirit of God gives us, fills us with his power, love, self-control. 2 Timothy, 7, 2 Timothy 1 and 7 tells us, The Spirit of God gives us, fills us with his power, love, and self-control. Here's the blessing. Here's a question for everyone to answer. How do we plug into God's power? How do we plug into the power of God? We will first believe, and then secondly, we must receive. We have, to we have to believe, and then we have to receive. When we go through deep waters and great troubles, I will be with you. You won't drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you won't be burned up. Isaiah tells us in 43, 2 and 3 tells us that. Just think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> they were thrown in the fiery furnace. They were like, hey, yeah, they're going to burn up. They looked in. They were going, what's going on in there? The presence of God was with them. He walks with you. So where do we get help when we are hurting? Where do we get help when we are hurting? Everybody knows that it rained this weekend. It's been a crazy weekend, a bunch of rain. Brother Bob was down in Texas. So I imagine he ran into a little bit of flooding. Well, I, I, I read something, I heard something. It was said that it was flooding down there, down that way. And a reporter sent out, the reporter was sent out to, this, to the neighborhood to check out the flooding. And when he got there, he saw this young lady, and she was sitting on her house. Her name was Joanne. And so he was asking her, what are you doing? And she says, well, it's flooding. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to stay safe. And when he got there, he saw chicken coops fly, walk, float by. He saw, he saw VW bugs float by. He saw, he saw all these things floating by. Then he noticed a hat float by. And about 20 feet down past the house, the hat floated back up, upstream. And then about 20 feet down, it floated back up the other way. 
So he goes, do you know what's going on with that? And she goes, no, that's just my husband. He told me he'd, he's going to cut the grass come hell or high water. That's kind of it. Y'all forgive me. <laughs> the problem we have today is that a lot of us are still focusing on the lawn while the house is floating by. We're so worried about what's going on that we can't see the big picture. Last week it was said, and, we are, and, it, and I believe this to be true, that we all need recovery. We all need recovery. I believe that. Because none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. The word is in, it says the world is imperfect. We all have been hurt. In one way or another, we all have been hurt. We all have some kind of hang up. We do. And we all have habits that we like to change. Everybody needs recovery. I believe that to be true. Everybody needs recovery. Everybody. The steps are the same regardless of the problem. That's the blessing is that the steps never change. No matter what your problem, no matter what your hang up, your hurt, your habit, the steps are exactly the same. And we went to the first two. We got to recognize that I'm not God. That there's a power greater than me. And then I got to earnestly seek God. The more insecure you are, the more you want to control things. Have you ever noticed that? The more insecure I am, the more I want to be in control of things. I, I, I'm him. Now, trust me, I have some insecurities. You might not believe because you, I get up here, but I'm insecure as all get out. You want to control your life. Or I want to control my life. You want to control other people's lives, control the environment, con control what God's going to do for you. Mm -mm. But we do. We want to control what God wants to do for us. You want to be the center of the universe. When we try to control everything, we end up fatigued, frustrated, and a failure. When we try to control everything, we end up with three things going for us. Fatigue, you will be tired. You will be mentally, physically, spiritually tired bankrupt. You will be frustrated because nothing's going to go your way unless God's in control. Right. Number three, you will be a failure because the only way to succeed is, to, is through the Father. Right. That's the only way. So how do you break free of that? How do you break free of that? That's the question. How do you break out of those things? You have to get past denial. And a lot of us don't even know we're in denial. That's the, that's the most awesome part about this denial thing. Is no one even believes they have denial. Denial is what keeps us from moving into recovery. It, it gives us excuses. It tells us I really don't have a problem. That's what denial tells me is I don't have a problem. It tells me also that I'm fine. Everybody else around me is the problem. That's what denial tells me also. It tells me that I can handle it when I really can't handle it. Only way I can make it is through Christ. But, I, but denial tells me, you don't need God for this one. Jesus is okay. Don't, you don't need Jesus for this. You can fix it yourself. We know we say the Bible study all the time. Well, at least we can pray. That would be the first thing we do. We excuse ourselves and we accuse others. Now, this is not a slight at my wife, but it says it in the book, so I'm going to read it. It says, if my wife would just get her stuff together, then our marriage would be fine. I am in trouble. <laughs> I don't know where to go from there. I, might, I need to stay with somebody tonight. And we play the blame game, and we accuse and we excuse ourselves. We, we excuse our shortcomings. We excuse what we do wrong. Our shortcomings are not that big a deal. But yours are major. Yours I see everywhere. I mean, I see you coming down the road. But me, perfect. I won't say nobody's name. 
she knows. It's so funny. I love this stuff. All right, so here's the other one. You know, we say, well, I'm good. My circumstances are fine. The deal is you jumped off the building, and you're halfway down, and you haven't hit rock bottom yet. You haven't. You haven't hit the, you haven't hit the ground yet. This week, this week, I, I, I read the newspaper every once in a while when someone blesses me with it because, you know, it's expensive. But I was reading the newspaper, and it said, this is a wonderful illusion of the now. It says, the lost and found. It was an ad in the paper. A three-legged dog, blind in, blind in the right eye, left ear missing, broken tail. Answers to the name Lucky. Now, that's what I called her now. <laughs> he answers to the name Lucky. How lucky is that poor puppy? I say it in group all the time. And, and, and like I said, you guys know what work. The now is just, it's not just, the now is not a river in Egypt. It's not. It's not just a river in Egypt. The now. Sometimes, and I don't think a lot of you guys understand, and I tell them all the time, the now means don't even know I'm lying. Don't even know I'm lying. Because we don't sometimes. But do you know there's an antidote to the Nile? There is an antidote. God has made a way for you to defeat the Nile. And he gives us lots of it sometimes. And it's called pain. <laughs> pain. Pain is the antidote to the Nile. What makes me finally face up to my problems? Pain. God's antidote for pain, for denial is pain. We rarely change. When we see the light, we change when we feel the heat. That's a fact. I, I have a saying that I use all the time. Until my consequences outweigh, It says, until my consequences outweigh the pleasure of what I'm doing, I will not change. Until I am in enough pain because of what I'm doing, I will not change. I won't. Because we don't think there's a problem. And if I don't believe there's a problem, why would I change? That's like me going to Sister Alicia because she's doing work, saying, Sister Alicia, I need $100, and she gives it to me. Then I go back tomorrow and say, Sister Alicia, I need another $100, and she gives it to me. Eventually, if I go there about 10 times, she's in some pain. <laughs> and she's going to be like, no. <laughs> and then I'm going to be in, the, in some pain because I'm going to be like, uh, I've been relying on that. Something's got to change. There's got to be some pain for me to change then you got to be in some kind of pain for you to change also. I would appreciate it if you gave it to me, but, you know, just so you know. Just so you know. But most people will never recover, will never deal with their issues until they've been to some kind of pain. Recovery cannot start, cannot even begin to start unless you've had some kind of pain. It's just, it's impossible. So God uses three denial busters. He's got three denial busters that he uses, and, 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 all three are, I wouldn't, I face them all, so I can't say anything. Things get our attention. He forces us to move into recovery from these three things. And the first one is crisis. We have a crisis, an illness, stress, loss of a job. Any of those things will cause you to, to take a look at yourself. Illness, then I realize that I'm not that powerful, and I've got to take a look at who has the power. Stress. God's got to do it because, my gosh, I'm stressed out. And the loss of a job, how am I going to pay my bills? God, I need a job. It's not until we know that God's the power that we start to get healed, start to get healing. And then there's confrontation, and I love this one. This is my favorite. I love confrontation. Y'all just don't even know. It's like it's the best thing ever in the world because I get to tell somebody or they get to tell me, 
And, but you got to do it with love. Here's the other thing. I see a lot of us go, you, man, it's got to be, be with love. They come to you and say, you know, you're blowing it. But someone's got to love you enough to come there and tell you, and tell you the truth, you're going to miss out. You're about to lose your family. You're about to die. And we see it. And we love you. And we don't want that to happen. You're about to lose your job because, see, you're not going to work like you used to. Somebody has to confront you. Now, they say that there's an old saying in Texas, and the saying is just not in Texas because I've heard it here in Arkansas also. also. I guess it's pretty close, so we'll, we'll call it. It says if someone tells you something one time, you know you can pretty much ignore it. But if, it tell you, if two people tell you the exact same thing, and my dad told me this a long time ago, he said if two people tell you the exact same thing, you might want to take a look at it. And if three different people tell you the exact same thing, you might want to try to fix it. Because it might be true. One person tells you, you, you can probably ignore it. Two people tell you, you might want to get a mirror and take a look at it. If three people tell you, you might want to start working on that problem. Because it is a problem. It is a problem. Three different people? Yeah, that's a problem. And then there is catastrophes. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it sounds like a lovely word, but really it's, it's a terrible word. <laughs> I hope you don't have to deal with this in your life, it says. When, you, when the bottom falls out physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, wrote, and, and, and in your relationships, when the bottom falls out and, you ha- and you've hit bottom, what happens is often that we just step back and God says, I've tried this, I've tried this, I've tried that. You want to do it? I'm going to step back. I'm going to let you run your life for a while. And when you get tired of hitting the ground and you ask me, then I'll step in and help you. And sometimes, sometimes, that means death. It does. Sometimes it means death. I don't necessarily like to talk about the subject because I hate it that much, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Greg said last week that the first step to recovery is to realize that I'm not God. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life has become unmanageable. My life has become unmanageable. That's the first step. And they call that the reality step. The second step is what we call the hope step. And it says, I admit I'm helpless. I'm powerless. There's a power that, there is a power. That's the good news. And that power, if we plug into it, can help us. The E stands for earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that his power can help me recover. Not my power, not Ben's power. Not Seth's power, not even my wife's power, but his power can help me recover. Anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. There are three parts to step two in the recovery. I must acknowledge that God exists. Most of us, or most of, most of you, have No problem with this. Because we're all in church. So we know that God exists. We believe that God exists. There aren't that many atheists left anymore. Did you know that? There are not that many atheists left anymore. Gallup, they did a Gallup poll. And the survey said that 96% 96 of the people in America believe that there is a God. Less than 2% say, I am an atheist. Less than 2%. I, I, I guess it's true. They took the poll, I didn't. Far fewer atheists today, there are far fewer atheists today than there were 50 years ago. Why? Because scientists have come to know that there had to be a creator of the universe. 
The scientists have come to believe that. Fewer people are willing to stick their neck, to stick their neck out and say, I believe all this world just happened randomly. People are not saying that anymore. So they're saying that there is a creator. There is a designer. To say that this world just happened by chance is to say that I take a watch, smash it up, put it in a bag, along with about a zillion other watches, shake them up, and then throw them out, and they all come back perfectly laid out. Impossible. Virtually impossible. So there's no way that it just all came together like that. It's just impossible. That's what the scientists are even starting to say now. I read this and I think it's kind of funny because it happened about 15, 20 years ago. It said on the, t- on the cover of Time magazine, scientists discover God is what they say. The scientists discover God. I, I discovered him years ago, but they, it took them that long, I guess. In this age, we know more and more about the universe and that it didn't happen by accident, that there had to be a creator. And we now acknowledge that he does exist. Romans 1 and 2 says, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen. I believe that to be true. If I wake up every morning, there, I work by the river. And I look out that window every day and I say, my gosh, God had to create this because no man can do this. No man can create that river and all those trees and how things flow. And He's a bad, bad man if he did. That's all I'm going to tell you. Psalms 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. In fact, the Bible says it's foolish to believe in God. It's foolish not to believe in God. Irrational, illogical, not to believe in God. If you have problems with that, You might want to come to a men's Bible study. You might want to read your Bible every day. You might want to get down and pray. You might want to ask God to show you. Because those are the facts. It tells you. The exact words. The Bible says it is foolish not to believe in God. Irrational, illogical. Not to believe in God. If you have a problem with that, you might want to Seek some help. I just believe that to be true also. The point is, God changes lives today. God does exist. God changes lives today. God does exist. I believe that. The real issue for most most is not, is there a God? Most people believe that to be true. The real issue is, what kind of God is he? What kind of God is he? What is he really like? Does it matter? The problem is we have some very strange ideas about what God is like. We have strange ideas about God, what God's like. We believe we make God into what we want him to be. That's why we have all these millions of religions and cults and because they've made their God into what they want. That's why people worship trees, stumps. They made God into a stump. God created the stump, but he's not the stump. (laughs) He says, I read this week, I read this this week about two delinquent boys in a Catholic school, and they had been misbehaving, and they were sent to the principal's office. And the principal knew what was really needed was God in their lives. So he brought the first boy in and he sat him down. I want to ask you a question. Where is God? Is what he asked him. Where is God? So the kid was frightened. He he was scared to death by the question, and he just sat there, and he didn't say anything. And the principal asked him again, like three or four times, where is God? Then he said, he told him, just get out of here. Just get out of here. So he sent him away, and and he walked by the second boy, and the second boy says, he asked, he told the second boy, he says, he said, what's going on? He says, I don't know, but eventually they can't find God. 
I can't find him. God's missing. And we've been blamed for him. <laughs> we've been blamed for him missing. Unfortunately, most of us, most of us, or most of you, get your ideals about God by thinking he's like our parent. And if that's the case, I would have been in trouble a long time ago. Your father and mother, tragic. Because if your father was aloft, unloving, then you tend to think God the Father is the exact same way as your father was. And our thoughts are, if I have a father here on earth that can't love me, how can there be a father in heaven that can love me? I mean, if your, your, your parents on earth can't love you, how can a parent in heaven that you don't see love you? And a lot of us face that problem. We face that, and that's an issue for us. We try to make God into our image. And we are to be made into his image. I'm going to say it again because I don't think people heard me. We try to make God into our image. We want God to be like us. And really, God wants us to be like him. That's the issue that we're facing nowadays. We're trying to put God in us by saying, God, you're just like me. And God says, no, you need to be just like me. You got this thing backwards. Every once in a while you hear, my idea about God, who made you the authority. Just because you have a certain idea about God, does not mean it's right. Where you get your ideas from about God? One place. Study to show yourself approved. Number two, understanding God's character. The second step in recovery is not just to acknowledge that he exists, but to understand his character. We've got to understand God's character. And how are you going to understand something unless you study it? You can't. I'm just going to take your word for it. That'd be awesome just to sit down and someone tell me all the information and I write down or record it and, 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 and that's it. That would be great. That means I wouldn't have to study. I wouldn't have to get tired and fall asleep in my Bible sometimes. That means I wouldn't have to be on the internet doing schoolwork. That'd be awesome. You know, somebody just come and tell me, this is what you need to know about God. It'd be great. What is he really like? Until you know what God is really like, you won't be able to trust him. Because you don't trust anybody you don't know. You taught that since you're about this big, I think. You don't trust strangers. You don't talk to strangers. So how can you trust God if you don't know God? If you don't know his character, you can't trust him. It's impossible. It's just simply impossible. I can't trust him. It just doesn't make sense. I'm not going to trust something or someone that I don't know about. Fortunately, God wants you to know about him. He's like. So he came to earth 2,500 years ago. His name was Jesus, 2,015 years ago. And he came in the form of a human being. He came as Jesus Christ. And he said, this is what God is like. We can know what God is like. And that's why I'm not going to say that one. Because I don't, I'm sorry. Notice this verse. Colossians 1. Christ is the visible expression of the invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, just look at Jesus because he's the visible expression of, God, of the invisible God. If you want to know what God's like, study Jesus. If you want to be like God, be like Jesus. If you want to walk with God, you have to walk with Jesus. If you're reading about Jesus and studying his life, we'll learn the whole, we'll learn a whole lot about God. Specifically, three things. What we learn about God from Jesus that helps get us over our habits, hurts, and hang-ups is number one, God knows all about our situations. He knows about our situations. I learned that God knows all my situations because I know, because he knows my habits, hurts, and hang-ups. He knows the good and the bad. Some of you have had 
tough weeks, months, our life. Look at what the Bible says in Psalm 56. You know how troubled I am. You've kept a record of my tears. Isn't that incredible that he kept a record of our tears? Nobody knows the troubles I've been through in my marriage. You're wrong. God does. Nobody knows the depression and the fear that I'm going through. God does. And he, and he keeps a record of your tears. He knows it all. Nothing escapes his notice. Nothing escapes God's notice. <coughs> Nothing escapes God. Psalms 31 tells us, You've seen the crisis in my soul. God is aware of, of your needs. And the Bible says he knows what you need even before you ask of it. He knows what we need even before we ask. So all we have to do is ask. How awesome is that? Just ask. It's so simple. So simple. He sees the crisis in your soul right now. Psalm 69. He knows how foolish I've been. Sometimes we even forget this part. We don't, want, we don't want God to know all the dumb stuff that we do. The fact is, there's nothing off the record with God. There's nothing off the record with God. He knows everything. That's what's so awesome, is that he knows everything. So, I can hide it from everybody else, but God knows. And so, when I get home, I have to get on my knees, repent, and do something different. Welcome to be human. Welcome to being human. Here's the awesome part. He still loves you. The fact is God is not shocked by your sin. That's awesome. God's not shocked by your sin. How awesome is that? You know how like when you do something wrong, your mom goes, mm-mm-mm, can't believe you did that. I'm shocked. Totally appalled. God says, I knew it was happening. Now, what are you going to do about it? That's humans. We're, you know, humans, we're like, I can't believe he did that. God's like, well, I knew you were going to do that. Now, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Your mom knew you were going to do something, Caleb. You're in trouble. I'm messing with you, good man. All right. So, now let's get back. He says, he knows the good days, he knows the bad days, he knows the dumb stunts that you pull, the foolish decisions. And amazingly, he still loves you. The fact is God is not shocked by your sin. You can do something wrong. God doesn't go, oh, no, how did I miss that? He knows it's coming long before we even do it. He even knows why we did it. And sometimes I don't even know why I do things. Don't. I'm a human. I'm like, I don't know why I did that, but it's done now. I don't know why I do some things. He, he knows what motivates you, even when we don't know what motivated us to do it. He's not shocked. He's not surprised. He's not disappointed. He knows you. How awesome is that, that a God that creates the universe knows little old me. Out of all these people, out of all the stuff that he has going on, he knows me. He's taking time to know me and to know you. And number two says, God cares about your situation. Psalms 103, he is like a father to us, tender, sympathetic, and he knows what we are made of. And that's dust. God knows what we're made of. Molecules. We're frail. We're not superhuman. Tender and sympathetic. That's the kind of God we, we serve. He knows you. God wants you to be father of many. God, excuse me. God wants to be the father that many of us have never had. 
I'm thankful that he's my father because for a while I didn't think I'd ever have one. How can God love me and his love never quit? He loves me on my good days. He loves me on our bad days. When I serve him and when even, even when I don't serve him, he loves me. When I'm right, when I'm wrong, he loves me. Because he loves us uncon unconditionally. We don't have to do anything special. We don't have to be like, all right, I'm going to read 1,200 Psalms. I'm going to read uh, all, the, all the Bible. I'm going to go to Bible study every day. I'm going to go be at church every time it opens. Anytime something happens, I'm going to volunteer. That's how God's going to love me. That's not what it takes with God. That's not what it takes. And that's awesome because I could never do all that. I'd be dead after about two days of that, just reading all day long, working all the time. I'd be just like, oh, I'm exhausted, God. <laughs> Lay down. I'd take a nap. I think that's what his disciples did, didn't they? Many of you who have been working the 12 steps know that step two is the higher power step. It's like it's our way of being introduced to something greater than ourselves. But I'm going to tell you, the only true higher power is Jesus Christ. Period. Amen. It's not the doorknob that they tell you in AA sometimes. It's not a group of people that they tell you sometimes in AA. It's Jesus Christ. Period. That's all. I, that's it. That's it. My job tells me I have to be What's the word I'm going to look for? Politically correct. And so I have to say of your choice. And it's so awesome that I get to say Jesus Christ here. God can change me and my situation. The good news, God can change me and my situation. Sometimes he changes me. Sometimes he changes my situations. Sometimes he changes both. And that's awesome. But he's waiting on me or you. And the blessing is he's got the power to do whatever needs to be done. Amen. Notice that Paul says, I pray that you, will be, that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him, believe in him. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you ever find yourself paralyzed by procrastination? I know I need to do this, but I just can't get started. Yeah, that's me. I do that sometimes. Do you ever feel like I just can't get on top of things? He says, I've got the power. If God can raise Jesus Christ from the dead, he can raise a dead relationship. He can rebuild a relationship. He can raise a person back to health. That's why we pray. He can set you free from your addictions. He can help you close the door on the past. So those memories stop haunting you if only you trust him. I don't know about you guys, but it's hard to shed the past. And the only way I know is through Jesus Christ. Luke 18 says, what is impossible for me is possible for God. The Bible says nothing is too hard for God. You say, You're, you don't understand my situation. I've tried to change but I can't. Nothing is impossible with God. And that situation that seems hopeless isn't. That situation that seems hopeless is not impossible for God. Because as humans, we, we get tired. We get sad. We get lonely. We get frustrated. And we want to give up. And God says, I never give up. I'm always here. Here's the point. The longer you postpone your pain, the farther your recovery gets away. The longer you deny it, postpone it, say it's not a problem, it's no big issue, I can deal with it by myself, I can handle it by myself, the fewer days you have on this earth, being all God meant for you to be. Let me say that one more time so you understand what I just said. 
the longer you postpone and deal with your denial, the less time you have on this earth in the presence of God. Because you're so worried about what the earth has for you and what mankind is thinking and your problems and your hang-ups and your hurts and your habits that you can't focus on Christ. And that's one day less with Jesus. One day less with Jesus. And I need every day I can with him because he needs to teach me some more. This recovery series is on spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is the process of expanding the windshield and shrinking the rearview mirror. If you've ever noticed, men and, 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 and ladies, if you were to have a rearview mirror bigger than your windshield, all you'd see is the past. All you'd see what was behind you. It's time that we shrink that rearview mirror and make it tiny and make that windshield huge so we can see what's coming and see where we're going. And where we're going is to a relationship with Christ. And where we're shrinking and making smaller is all those things, those habits, hurts, hang-ups that have kept us away from Christ. We need to accept God's offer to help us. It's not enough just to believe in God. Most of us believe in God. But that hasn't wiped away our hurts. We've got to plug into the power, and, and that's more than just believing. Here's what God has to offer. In Philippians 2, 13, for God is at work within you, given the will and the power to achieve his purpose. God says, willpower on your own is not enough. Willpower on your own is not enough. Because if that's the case, I'd, I'd be honest with you. I had a bunch of habits, hang-ups, hurts. And if it was, I would have stopped years and years ago if, if I could have done it myself. I would have. You guys that have been in the church forever, you know my past. And if I could have stopped years ago, I would have. I couldn't. The only way I could ever stop is through Jesus Christ. I had to plug into his power. So you say you don't know if you want to change. I'm scared to death of change. Then you say, God, I'm willing, to be, I'm willing to be made willing. I don't even know what I want to change yet, but I know I need to change. You probably don't, <laughs> you probably don't understand pain exceeds your fear of change. But you say, God, make me willing to be willing to change. And then he will give you the will and the power to plug into him. Make me willing to be willing to change. That's a lot of, work. That's a lot of wills. But the main one is God's will. Make me willing to accept what it takes. And that's you, Jesus. What happens when I open up my life to God's power? When I ask God to put his spirit of Jesus Christ in my life, what does that do? It turns me into some kind of religious nut, and that's not true. It doesn't turn you into a religious nut. The Bible tells us exactly what happens when we invite God's Spirit into our lives. The Spirit of God gives us, fills us with power, love, and self-control. And that's what, I want for, that's what I want in my life. That's what I want. I want the Spirit of God. I want to be filled with His power, His love and self-control. First, I want the power in my life. I want the power to break habits that I can't break. I want the power to do things that I know aren't, that I know are right, and do, and do the right thing. I want the power to do the right thing. I want the power to break free from the past, let those memories go. I want the power to get on with the kind of life God meant for me to live. Then I want love. I want real love. I want to be able to love people and have them love me. 
and let go of my hurts. I don't want to build up all those walls and all these fake intimacies, but I want to be genuine. I want a genuine love. And for the longest, I didn't have that. I didn't know how to have that until I found Jesus Christ. I did not know how to really love. That's the only way you're going to really get true love, that unconditional love, no matter what. Even when you're angry, when things are bad, you still love that person, and you still, you still want the best for them. Doesn't mean you have to hang out with them, but you still want the best for them. There's a principle in this universe. This may sound real simple, but, it's, but this is profound. I have learned that things work best when I'm plugged in. Simple. Toasters work better. Coffee machines, coffee makers work better. I mean, you plug coffee. I, and I love coffee, so you know I'm plugging that in. You know? Blenders work better. Televisions work better. Radios work better. Anything works better when it's plugged into a power. And when we plug into the power of Christ, we work better. Amen. Simple. That's a simple process. Real simple. Believe and receive. First, I believe that God exists, and I believe that he does know and care and have a power to help me. And then I receive him into my life. Jesus Christ, put your spirit in me. You do that by using a four-letter word. Shh, it's not a cuss word this time. The second step of recovery involves a four-letter word, and that word is help. It's help. I need help. God, I need your help in my life. The road to recovery is not easy. It means facing up to some of the real problems you haven't wanted to deal with. It means asking or taking some risks. It means being honest, trusting God. But when you take the second step, all of a sudden your recovery is no longer simply a matter of willpower. God says, I will be with you. I don't know about you guys, but I kind of like the fact that God's with me. I kind of like that. Isaiah 43 says, when you go through deep waters and great troubles, I will be with you. You won't drown. When you walk through the fire of oppressions, you won't be burned. God says, I will be with you this next month, this next week, this year. As you face these issues you've been afraid to face in your life. So I'm asking, where are you hurting today? Are you going through some deep waters? Do you feel like you're under, you're about to go under, and you're about to take your last breath? Are you going through a fire right now? Is the heat getting to you? Do you think you're about to burn out? Do you feel like you're stuck in a rut? I just can't get the power to change. How about I feel powerless? Know this. Believe this. There is a higher power you can plug into. His name is Jesus Christ. The name above all names. I invite you to open your hearts and your life today. To take the, sep to take the second step. To accept Jesus Christ as your life into your life. Our altars are always open. You always have an opportunity to come down and ask God to take away some of those hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Just leave me if you would. This morning, if you have a hurt, a habit, a hang-up, something that's keeping you away from Jesus, something that's keeping you from, from just letting go, from truly accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior, our altars are always open for you to come down and ask him into your heart, to ask him for the power to change, to ask him for the power to fix those issues, to ask him to guide you in the way that you should go, to heal you, 
when you need to be healed. You have an opportunity. And I would not feel well or feel good when I left if I didn't offer that opportunity to you to come to the altars and ask God to help you with those hurts, those habits, those hang-ups, those things that you can't take to anyone else, that you think no one knows about, the things you have no control over but you're still trying to control. That lost feeling when you wake up in the morning and you don't know what I'm to do. The anxiety, the frustration, the stress of this world. God can heal all those things. Pray with me. Father God, this evening, this morning, we want to just thank you, Lord, for, for all that you've done. Thank you. We want to thank you, Lord, for your, for your word being spoken. God, we want to thank you for your power that we, can, that we have the ability to plug into. God, we want to thank you that you give us a way out when we feel like there's no way out. We want to just say, God, I need you, and I don't know what else to do. Thank you for your unconditional love. Thank you for your sacrifice to Jesus Christ who died for me and I'm, not, and I'm unworthy. We want to tell you thank you for that. God, take away these habits, these hurts, and these hang-ups that we have. God, all these things that we're hiding that we say no one knows about, take those away from us, Lord. God, this morning I ask that you just guide us and guide our church family spiritually allow us to grow give us a peace Father God that surpasses any, anything that we ever thought was imaginable and as we continue to go through this series Lord may we just grow the leaders that we need so that we might be able to reach people that are truly in need of you in your son Jesus name this morning we praise you and we thank you Amen. You